أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين ثم الصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد ولعنة الله على أعدائهم ومنكر فضائلهم من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي السلام عليكم dear brothers and sisters ورحمة الله وبركاته I'd like to welcome you all to another session on the tafsir of Surah Ar-Rum and alhamdulillah we've reached we left off at verse number 40 so we'll be picking up our discussion uh, from there inshallah so if you have a copy of the mushaf uh, you can follow along inshallah a'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim bismillah ar-rahman ar-rahim allahu alladhi khalaqakum thumma razaqakum thumma yumitukum thumma yuhyikum هل من شركائكم من يفعل من ذلك من شيء سبحانه وتعالى عما يشركون In verse number 40 we read God it is who created you then sustained you then he causes you to die then he gives you life Is there anyone among those you ascribe as partners who does any of that Glory be to him, and exalted is he above the partners they ascribe. This is one of the many verses in the Holy Quran which refers to the stages of existence, the, the, the various stages of human existence, where we are brought into being, we are given life, we are caused to die, and then we are given life once again, meaning that we're resurrected. And interestingly, when you look at this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala functions as the, the creative agent in each of these stages. So Allah الذي خلقكم, He is the one who created you. He brought you into being. Now, even though this happened through the agency of your parents, the ultimate agent is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he is the one who created you. And he is the one who sustains you and nourishes you. Now, of course, we derive nourishment from, from food, from, from plants. You know, we have other human beings who deliver our sustenance to us. But in this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala functions as the creative agent because everything else, everything else is simply a means through which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala delivers that nourishment. And he causes you to die. So even though your life may be taken by someone, say that you were you were wrongfully killed, you were murdered. Now the, the, the crime was committed, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ultimately decides if that action is going to terminate your life or not. And he will give you life. So he is the one who gave you existence. He is the one who nourishes you. He is the one who causes you to die. Now at all of these stages, there are intermediaries. You know, you were brought into existence through your parents, but they didn't create you. They were simply the, the instruments that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used to bring you into being. You are nourished through, through things that God created. You're nourished through your food, through your drink. You know, your parents oftentimes nourish you. You're nourished through the oxygen in the air. But all of these things are, are agents. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the ultimate agent. He is the ultimate cause. Another human being may take your life, but 
in, in actuality, in reality, Allah is the one who causes you to die. He is the one who ultimately terminates, uh, he causes death, and he gives you life. He is the one who brings you to life. Now, even though it is Israfil who blows the trumpet, it is not Israfil who is giving you life. In the same way, it was not your parents who gave you existence. That these all function as intermediaries. So you see in this ayah, Allah introduces himself as the one who created you. Not only did he create, did he create you, he sustains you and he nour nourishes you. He causes you to die. And he is the one who causes you. He gives you life. Now, when you look at these phases of existence, so there was there was a point where we didn't exist. Yes, as Allah says in Surah Ad-Dahr, هَلْ أَتَى عَلَى الْإِنسَانِ حِينٌ حين مِنَ الدَّهْرِ لَمْ يَكُنْ شَيْئًا مَذْكُورًا there was a time where you were not worth mentioning. Some scholars understand this as meaning that you didn't exist or you existed as a single cell in the loins of your fathers. You were not even worth mentioning. And then Allah gave you life. And then he causes you to die, which is another stage of your existence. Death is, an, is a stage after the, the, the existence in this earthly life. And then he brings you back to life on the day of judgment. Now, of all of these stages, the one that is eternal is the final stage. So our existence as spirits was a temporal existence. Our existence in alam dunya is a temporary existence. It's a temporary phase. When we die, the stage of death, that is a temporary existence. Alam barzakh is a temporary world. But the final stage, thumma yuhiikum, when he gives you life in the hereafter, when the, the bodies and the souls are united, are you reunited? That marks the final stage of man's existence. And this stage, you know, especially the hereafter in general, there, there, it's, it's really the most important phase of our existence in terms of its finality. Now, there's a beautiful statement from Imam al Hussein salam that I'd like to share. It's a very short statement. And it's actually a letter that Imam al Hussein salam wrote to his brother, his half-brother, Muhammad ibn al Hanafiya, who had a disability and was not able to join Imam al Hussein salam in Karbala. And the narration is from Imam al Baqir. So Imam al Baqir salam reports the incident. He says, كتب الحسين بن علي من كربلاء That Imam Hussein wrote a letter from Karbala. So when he was in Karbala, he writes the following letter. What does Imam al Hussein write in this letter? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. He begins with the Basmala. He begins in the name of God, the compassionate, the merciful. من الحسين من الحسين بن علي Ila Muhammad ibn Ali. From Hussein, son of Ali, to Muhammad, son of Ali, Muhammad ibn al Hanafi. What does the Imam say? You know, there were many people who decided not to join the Imam because they were either afraid for their lives or they had certain, you know, worldly interests that they wanted to protect. Look at what Imam al Hussein writes. A very a one sentence, but what a powerful sentence. He says, Amma Bad dunya lam takun. Imam al Hussein he says to his brother, and this is a message really for all of us. He says, It is as though this world never was. 
it's so it passes by so quickly that it's as though it didn't even exist. And it's as though the hereafter always was. It's as though there is nothing but Alamul Akhir. Wassalam. And the Imam says, that's that was the that was the entirety of his letter. It is as if this dunya never was, and it's as if the hereafter always existed. So this shows you, brothers and sisters, that we are all moving. We're moving towards that eternal life. And the decisions that we make in dunya build our eternal abode. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is saying that I am the one who created you. I am the one who nourished you. I am the one who... I am the one uh, who causes you to die. And I am the one who gives you life. Is there anyone among those you ascribe as partners to me who does any of that? The things that we, that we worship, the things that we make the focal point of our lives, do any of those things, whether they are desire, our desire, whether they are our desires, our egos, is there anything that has the power to give us what Allah gives us? We give so much time and attention and we try to appease things and people that don't have the power to give us any of those things. Nothing has the power to give you existence. Nothing has the power to nourish you without his permission. Nothing can cause you to die without, without his leave. And nothing can bring you back to life except him. So why worship anything why submit to anything why surrender to anything other than him is there any of your partners that have the power to do this so allah is introduced in this verse as the creator the sustainer the causer of death and the giver of life i mean is there anything that is more important in the life of the human being the source of all of these things is allah azza wa jalla so Allah says, do the things that you worship, are they able to do any of these things? Indeed, they're not. Subhanahu wa ta'ala amma yushrikun. Glory be to him. And exalted is he above the partners they ascribe. No matter what we conceive, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above He's above that. Our descriptions of Allah fall short of his reality. Our imagination, no matter what our minds can concoct, falls short of his majesty and his greatness. But there, there are only a certain group of people who are able to describe Allah in a way that is befitting. You know, when people speak about God and they try to describe him and they try to capture his greatness and his essence, Allah always says, فَسُبْحَانَ amma yasifun." That God is far above what they say or what they describe. But there is, there are certain verses in the Quran where Allah says there are only a certain group of people who get it right. So if you look at Surah Safat, Surah 37, Verses 159 to 160. Allah says, Subhan Allah Amma Yasifun. Glory be to God. He is above what they ascribe. He is above the descriptions that they give. Illa ibadallahi al Except his chosen servants. Except his servants, the chosen ones. Meaning, Ibadallah al they describe God in a way that is befitting. Anyone else, anyone other than a ma'soom is not able to describe God in a way that is appropriate or befitting. If you look at Nahjul Balagha, 
Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, his description of God is perfectly in sync with the Quranic conception of God. When the Prophet speaks about Allah, his description of the divine is, is in parallel with the Quran. When Musa speaks about Allah, when Ibrahim speaks about Allah, they, they, they describe him as he deserves to be described. But everyone else falls short because they don't have that level of ma'rifah. Subhanallah amma yasifun illa ibadallah al Except God's chosen servants. They are the ones who, who describe, him, describe him in a way that is befitting. And this is really the meaning of the takbir. You know, the narration, a narration uh, says that a man was in the presence of Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. And the Imam alayhi salam asked him, what is the meaning of Allahu Akbar? You know, this takbir, we recite it multiple times throughout the day. At, at, at minimum, we recite Allahu Akbar at minimum five times a day. At minimum, you know, to, to enter into the prayer, you have to recite takbiratul ihram. Now, all of the other takbirat are mustahab. But at the bare minimum, you have to recite takbir five times a day. Now, what is the meaning of this takbir? What does it mean when we say Allahu Akbar? That God is, is greater. You know, it seems as though there is a blank that God is greater than what? So some people have this understanding that he's greater than everything, meaning that he's greater than the sun, he's greater than the moon. It's like there's a blank and you can plug in any word and God is greater than that thing, than that entity. So this is what the this is what the man says to Imam Islam. He says, it means that Allah is greater than this and he's greater than that. He's greater than the sun and the moon and the earth and the heavens. The Imam says, no, haddatta. That by comparing God to his creation, you have limited him. So he so the man asked Imam Al-Sadiq, what is the meaning of Allahu Akbar? The Imam says what it means, the reality of Allah Akbar is Allahu Akbaru min an yusaf, that God is greater than any description. And, and even if you look at the description of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib in Nahjul Balagha, the Imam he describes God, but in reality, he is describing the indescribability of God. That is why they are able to speak about God because they're able to articulate the transcendence of God in a way that no one can, that no one can achieve. Then we go to the next verse, verse 41. ظهر الفساد في البر والبحر بما كسبت أيدي الناس ليذيقهم بعض الذي عملوا لعلهم يرجعون. Corruption has appeared on land and sea because of that which the hands of men have earned, that he may let them taste some of that which they have done. So perhaps they might return. Now, the most important word in this ayah that really will allow us to unlock the meaning of the ayah is the word fasad. What is the meaning of the word fasad in this context? You know, the word fasad, it means corruption. And this word in the Quran has a very broad meaning. So the word fasad, it has many meanings. It has many implications. But to understand what is meant by the word fasad, you have to, you have to understand the context. So when you look at the Quran in general, the word fasad is used in a number of ways. So for example, the word fasad refers generally to, to, to decadence, to injustice. You know, if you recall, brothers and sisters, in 
Surah Al-Baqarah, verse number 30, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala declares to the malaika, to the angels, khalifa, that he announces that I am placing a vicegerent on earth in the form of Adam. What was their what was their response to this divine announcement? What did they say? Are you going to place on the earth a creature that will cause fasad, that will cause corruption? So sometimes fasad is a reference to the, the sinful actions of people, the decadence, the injustice, the oppression. And it refers in many cases to open disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this rebelliousness. In other verses, fasad is, is used to mean the result and the consequence of our actions, the negative consequence of our actions. So if you look at Surah Al-Mu'minun, Surah number 23, verse 71, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَوْ اتَّبَعَ الْحَقُّ أَهْوَاءَهُمْ لَفَسَدَتِ السَّمَاوَاتُ وَالْأَرْضُ وَمَنْ فِيهِمْ That if the truth was subservient to their desires and their whims, the heavens and the earth would have been corrupted. Meaning, the system of creation would have been disrupted. So in the Quran, fasad in some instances is what ensues when people follow their desires and they reject divine values. Now, what is the meaning of fasad in this verse? Now, to understand the meaning of fasad in this verse, we have to, we have to, we, we gain a clue. There is a contextual clue in the verse that reveals the meaning of the word fasad, that re reveals the meaning of the word corruption. That corruption has appeared on land and sea. Bima kasabat aid in nas because of that which the hands of men have earned. So from this part of the ayah, from this phrase, we can understand that the meaning of fasad is not the sin itself, but rather it is the negative consequence of the actions of people, the sins of people. Because Allah says what at the end of the ayah? Why has this corruption appeared on land and the sea? Because of it's because of the actions of the people that he may let them taste some of that which they have done. So here fasad seems to mean that this is a punishment, a worldly punishment for the sins that were perpetuated by people, that were perpetrated by people. Now, so the corruption here is not a description of the actions itself. It's a description of, it's, it's a referring to the, the adverse, the negative ramifications, the negative consequences of human conduct, especially when that conduct runs, runs in contrast to divine values. Now, why, why is there corruption? Meaning that the system of creation becomes corrupted. Now, the reason is, since everything in creation is in total submission to Allah Azza wa Jal. 
when human beings commit sin, they are disrupting the created order. You know, it's almost as though that everything else in creation is synchronized. And then there's a break in that synchronization. You know, if you can imagine, you know, soldiers marching in perfect synchrony, in perfect orderly lines. And then you have one soldier who's fidgeting or who's turning around. What happens is that if that soldier moves, he can knock over the other soldier. So imagine you have people marching in orderly lines and they're moving in one direction. They're perfectly synchronized. And then one of them falls. What happens? It creates what? This ripple. There is a disruption in the created order. And this, and the Quran mentions this concept of this idea that creation as a whole is in, is, is in submission to God. So in Surah Al Ra'ad, surah, surah number 13, verse 15, what does Allah say? To Allah prostrates whomsoever is in the heavens and on the earth. So everything is in a state of ibadah. Everything is in a state of submission. Everything is in a state of sujood. And therefore, when human beings disobey God, it causes corruption in the system, in the created order. And this is why Imam al-Sadiq when he explains this verse, he speaks about the meaning of corruption in the sea. He says, Hayatu bil bahar bil matar. That the, the life of aquatic creatures, creatures that inhabit the sea, depends on rain. Now, you know, when, when you read this hadith, you would think that the imam would have said, that terrestrial, terrestrial creatures depend on rain. But Imam al-Sadiq is saying that aquatic animals, marine life, depends on rain. فَإِذَا كَفَّ الْمَطَرِ And I'll share with you, you know, the scientific miracle of what the Imam is saying. The Imam is saying when rain ceases to fall, when there's a drought, ظَهَرَ الْفَسَادُ فِي الْبَرِّ وَالْبَحْرِ Imam al-Sadiq says when rain ceases to fall, meaning when there's a drought, there is corruption in the sea and in the land. وَذَلِكَ إِذَا كَثُرَتْ الْذُنُوبُ وَالْمَعَاصِي And that happens, meaning that the system of creation becomes corrupted as a result of excessive sinning and disobedience to Allah. Now, we might not understand the relationship between disobeying God and rainfall and earthquakes and natural phenomenon, but our inability to see that relationship does not negate that that relationship exists. Now, what does Imam al-Sadiq mean? At least... What have we discovered about the relationship between droughts and marine life and aquatic life? So scientists have, have done a lot of research on the effect of droughts. And, and there are many ahadith that speak about how widespread oppression affects rainfall, how it affects this, this type of divine blessing. Now, marine biologists, for example, from Baylor University, showed that drought conditions adversely affect water quality and make some chemicals in the water more toxic and more likely to accumulate in fish. So when there are extended droughts, what happens is that the water becomes more toxic and that those toxic chemicals begin accumulating in, in these sea creatures. 
And they even found that when rain doesn't fall, that the, the quality of the water diminishes and it actually impacts the water's pH levels. So you see human behavior, you know, our moral failings, according to the Quran, according to Hadith literature, indicate that there is a direct relationship between disobedience disobedience of God and the and enjoying some of these blessings. So we have many ahadith that say a lot of human suffering in the form of droughts and earthquakes are directly connected to uh, to sinning and to acts of disobedience. Now you and I, you know, we can't point at any specific drought or any specific earthquake and say that this is a result of people's uh, sinning. We don't know that, but we can't pinpoint exactly, but the Quran does make that argument and the ahadith seem to support that, uh, that position. So, that the natural order becomes corrupted and this is a consequence. This is because of the actions of people and this happens, Allah allows this corruption to take place, this disruption to occur, so that he may let them taste some of which they have done. Now what does this mean? It means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, out of his mercy, he, he allows us to experience some form of trial and punishment in this life. So Allah allows us to experience some of the consequences of our sins in this life in hopes that it will awaken us and we will return to him, that we will repent and return to him. And this is this message is echoed in Surah As-Sajda, for example, Surah 32, Ayah 21, where Allah says, That surely we will make them taste the lesser punishment instead of the greater punishment. So perhaps they may return. And the lesser punishment refers to the negative consequences of our sins that become manifest in this earthly life. And Allah allows us to see that. He allows us to experience that in hopes that it would, it would help us arise from our spiritual slumber. So, so since everything, so going back to the, the, the message of the verse, so since everything in creation is in total submission to Allah, the disobedience of human beings creates a disruption in the created order that manifests, partially manifests in the material world. And that is designed for us to, to wake up, to repent, and to seek Allah's forgiveness so we can be absolved of the experience of the full punishment uh, that would uh, that would be experienced in the hereafter. Verse number forty-two. قُلْ سِيرُ فِي الْأَرْضِ فَانْظُرُوا كَيْفَ كَانَ عَاقِبَةُ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلُ كَانَ أَكْثَرُهُمْ مُشْرِكِينَ Say, of course the Prophet is being addressed here. He's instructed by Allah to say, journey upon the earth or travel throughout the earth and observe how those before you fared in the end, most of whom were idolaters, most of whom associated partners with God. Now, this verse also supports the, the meaning that I proposed in, uh, in verse number 41, where the understanding was that ظهر الفساد في البر والبحر refers to the negative consequences of the sins that we commit, that we experience in this life. 
Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that travel throughout the earth and observe the aqibah, the consequence of the actions of past nations. So the message of verse 41 and 42 is really about understanding the worldly consequences of our iniquities and in hopes that we may turn back to Allah and seek his forgiveness. And this verse is really an invitation to reflect, to ponder over the fate, not just of individuals, but the fate of individuals and societies. You know, when we study history, brothers and sisters, when we study Greek civilization, when we study Roman civilization, when we study Chinese dynasties, when we study the empires of the past, oftentimes we speak about their rise to power. We speak about their, their literary contributions. We speak about their, their artistic contributions, their, their medical advancements, their scientific contributions. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is inviting us to pay attention to the most important part of history. And that is the aqibah. What was the end? You know, people study the pharaohs. They study all of these powerful civilizations. But Allah says, study what happened to them. What was their downfall? That you're going to see a common theme. That study what, what, what happened to these people. And you will see that whenever people build a system that is incompatible with divine values, the fate is the same. They all crumble. They all fall. There is not a single empire that existed in the past that still exists today. Think about what happened to all of these people. What happened to the pharaohs? What happened to these kings and these emperors? They're swept into the dustpan of history. You know, there was a time when, when the likes of Muawiyah and Yazid, people used to shake when they used to hear their names. Their names would be echoed through every corner of the Islamic empire. Now, are these people even mentioned? They virtually, they practically don't exist. And then you, then you look at awliyaullah. That even, even though during their lives they had very little support, the name of Ibrahim is raised. The name of Isa is raised. The name of Musa is raised. The name of Rasulullah is elevated. The name of Ali is raised. You look and you see the dome of Musa ibn Ja'far al-Kazim. Where is, where is the dome of Harun al-Rashid? Allah says, Think about how these past nations fared. Don't just talk about them in the context of what they contributed or you know, how, you know, how beautiful their palaces were or how beautiful the architecture was. Where is that architecture? Where are those people that used to sit on those thrones? Those are the questions that we have to ask. We have to study History from an Islamic lens, we have to really ask what causes the downfall of civilizations? What causes these empires to topple? And it often happens when they start oppressing. When zulm reaches a breaking point. When they become excessive in their oppression, in their injustice. But a system that is based on justice and divine values that is a system, that is a, that is a civilization that will be resilient, that will endure. There's a hadith from Imam al-Sadiq where, you know, when you read this verse, some people have this impression that Allah is asking us to go and physically travel throughout the earth. Now, of course, most people don't have the luxury of traveling through the earth and, 
and witnessing firsthand the ruins of past civilizations. And especially during the pandemic, we don't have that luxury. So what does Imam al-Sadiq say? He teaches us that to travel throughout the earth doesn't require you to really leave your house. The Imam says, Ana bidalik, what Allah means by this is, or one of the meanings of this verse is, fil Quran. Go through the Quran. Look through the Quran and see what happened and read about and reflect on what happened to the, the, civiliz the civilization of Thamud, the people of Thamud, the people of Ad. What happened to Sodom and Gomorrah? What happened to Namud? What happened to Fir'aun? The Imam salam, says the Quran takes you on a stroll. It takes you on a scroll, a historical scroll. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows you. He talks about what happens, what happened to those, those perished nations. So reflect on them. The Quran mentions Ad and Thamud. Go do your independent research. Go do your independent research on Pharaoh, on all of these past civilizations, on Queen Sheba and her, her empire. Where are all these people now? Where are all of these superpowers now? The only superpower is Allah. The only, the only one, the only kingdom that has endured is Allah's kingdom. To whom does the kingdom belong to today? To Allah, the overwhelmer, the majestic. Verse number 43. فَأَقِمْ وَجْهَكَ لِلدِّينِ الْقَيِّمِ فَأَقِمْ وَجْهَكَ لِلدِّينِ الْقَيِّمِ مِنْ قَبْلِ أَنْ يَأْتِيَ يَوْمٌ لَا مَرَدَّ لَهُ مِنَ اللَّهِ يَوْمَئِذٍ يَصَّدَّعُونَ And set your face to the upright religion before there comes a day from God that none can repel. That day they will be spread asunder. فَأَقِمْ وَجْهَكَ لِلدِّينِ الْقَيِّمِ Set your face towards the upright religion. Meaning, embrace the religion of Allah wholeheartedly. Don't do it half-heartedly. You know, some of us, we adhere to Islam when it's convenient. We have a very conditional relationship with Allah. You give me what I want and I'll, I'll obey you. As long as your commandments suit and they, they, they correspond with my whims and my values, then I'll obey you. Allah speaks about this phenomenon. People who have a conditional relationship with God, a transactional relationship with Him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah 22, Surah Al-Hajj verse 11 there are some people who worship God on a brink, on a cliff, or on an edge. If good befalls him, he's content. If life is good, I'm happy with Allah. Allah is my best friend when things are going well. But if a trial befalls him, he is turned over upon his face. Meaning that there is no true faith. There is no true adherence to the message. Turn your face. or Reorient your entire being towards this upright religion. Allah describes his deen as being qayyim, it's firm. It's not a wobbly tradition. This is a tradition that is based on haq, it's based on reason, it's based on intellect. It's not just blind faith, it's not a wobbly, you know, weak foundation. It's qayyim, it's, it's an upright religion, it's a fortified religion. 
and set your face to this upright religion in this life before there comes a day get your act together before there comes a day from God that none can repel what is this day? the day of judgment you can't run away from that day you can't escape that day Imam Zain al-Abideen alayhi salam in dua Abi Hamza al-Thumali, he beautifully articulates this. The inescapability of divine reckoning. He says, وَأَنَا يَا سَيِّدِي And look at how the Imam speaks. وَأَنَا يَا سَيِّدِي عَائِدٌ بِفَضْلٍ O my master, I seek refuge in your grace. You, there's no one that you can seek refuge from with Allah. I retreat from you, I run away from you by running towards you. Meaning the only way for me to run away from your punishment is to run to you and ask for your mercy. There's no one that can shield me from your chastisement. No one can repel the day of judgment. Every single person will be arraigned on that day. Fir'aun, the same man who used to say, Ana Rabbukum al-A'la, will stand as a humbled abd of Allah on the day of judgment. We will all be there. Can't escape it. There is no such thing as absence. You know, sometimes you're absent. You're not in class or you're not at work. You can call off. No one can call off on the day of judgment. There is no absent. There is no tardiness on that day. So you come out of your grave and you, you're standing before God. You cannot repel that day. What you can repel is Allah's punishment if you prepare for that day. But that day is going to happen. The Prophet is going to experience that day. No matter who, the Ma'sumin are going to experience that day and the Mujrimin are going to experience that day. No one can repel that day. On that day, they will be spread asunder, meaning that they will be divided on that day. What does it mean that they'll be divided? It means that on that day, we, are, we will be grouped not by the color of our skin, not by our family relations. It's not that Allah resurrects families together and, you know, you know, this family's together and that one. You will be grouped based on your spiritual affinity. You will be grouped with people who are spiritually similar to you. People will be called with their imams, your leaders. Who do you resemble in your conduct? People will be separated on that day. And the Quran suggests that they, they will be separated into, but there will be three main groups. Ashabu Shiman, who are destined for the hellfire, people of the left hand. Ashabu Yameen, the companions of the right hand, the pious, the God fearing, those who will be paradise bound. And then you have what? Wasabiqoon as Sabiqoon. You have the foremost. Of the foremost. These are the ones who will be brought very close to Allah. And we want to be among the sabiqun. We don't just want to be among Ashab al -yamin. So when it's the time of Salah, don't wait two, three hours to perform your Salah. Be among the sabiqin. Be among those who race towards goodness, who are the first ones to do good. Not You don't want to be among the straddlers. You want to be among the foremost. On that day, they will be separated. So the only thing, the only bond that will remain will be the bonds of faith. Musa had a, uh, Nuh had a son, a biological son. You think Nuh and his biological son will be standing together on the day of Qiyamah? They will be separated. There are people, Abu Lahab, the uncle of the Prophet, 
Do you think he will be standing with Rasulullah on that day? He will not. He will be separated from him. Salman al-Farisi, who is from another nation, who's not even an Arab, who came from another part of the world, will be with Rasulullah on that day. Not because Salman belongs to the same family of the Prophet. Not, be, not because he's an Arab or he's from Quraysh. It's because they followed the same path. There was, there was a spiritual similarity, compare, co compatibility between the Prophet and Salman. Yawma idhin yasadda'oon. I think we'll leave our discussion uh, there. We'll continue with uh, verses 44 and 45 next week. Bi'idhnillah wa akhir da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu ala muhammad wa alihi al-tahirin. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Arjum. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi Do sins have a ripple effect? So that one sin leads to another one, perhaps bigger and worse than the original one? So we have narrations. For example, we have a narration from Imam Rida alayhi salam where he says, beware of minor sins because they pave, they are the, the roads, they pave the way for major sins. So if someone doesn't repent, then, then those those sins could embolden someone to commit more, um, more serious, uh, you know, acts of disobedience. So this is why, you know, asking Allah for forgiveness immediately after the sin is uh, is very important. We have some narrations that mention that when a person commits a sin, the angels, the angels that record. Our, our, uh, our misdeeds, our sins, they they don't record it immediately. Some narrations mention seven hours that they don't write the sin, and that that seven hour period. And the words, the number seven, doesn't necessarily mean you know the out one one hour more than six hours, but rather it's a time, it's a period of time that's considered like a grace period where you are afforded the opportunity to repent so that the sin would not even have appeared on your record. Because having that sin recorded and then having it erased is, uh, is uh, you know, it, it's, it leaves a type of blemish. So when you, when you treat, it, it's kind of like when you get sick. It's always better to treat the illness immediately. If you don't repent, it's, it's analogous to allowing a, uh, an infection to fester. And when an infection festers, it can become more and more serious. Thank you, Sheikh. And uh, when you were talking about how the downfall of nations happens when, uh, over time when they become excessive in their oppression, could you uh, describe more uh, that in more detail? What type of uh, actions and sins are more are like more likely to contribute to that? So we we have narrations that. <clears throat> that mentioned that, you know, for example, Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, he says there is nothing that allows nations to flourish like justice. So from this hadith, from this narration from Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen, that if, if justice allows nations to flourish and prosper, conversely, oppression and injustice causes nations to collapse so when when nations when you have systemic injustice where people are being oppressed where you are creating a society that is widening the gap between the rich and the poor and the the, the rights of god are not being observed and the rights of people are not being observed you know this is this is a recipe for for disaster and you'll find that that nations that, uh, and even, even, even from a secular perspective, you know, dictatorships don't last for a very long time. 
you know, they might last a few decades, maybe even a, a couple hundred years, but in the end, they, uh, they're just not sustainable. That, that justice is what allows nations to flourish. And, but what is justice? You know, justice is very ambiguous. It's abstract. What does justice look like practically? This is where Islam and the traditions of Ahlul Bayt give us some direction because justice needs to happen on an individual level and on a societal level. So there has to be, your relationship with God has to be, you know, uh, your relationship with yourself needs to be on the basis of justice, your family members, society. So a, uh, a nation that is, that is built on notions of justice that are guided by Islamic values is, is a, uh, a civilization that will, uh, that will endure. Given that Allah cannot be understood, how can we connect with him? You know, that, it's a, that's a beautiful question because connecting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, when you think about Allah, it's, it's a very paradoxical relationship in the sense that, you know, that, that's why in Dua al-Iftitah, in the month of Ramadan, we recited we described Allah as being that he is so far, he is so distant that he cannot be seen, meaning that he is, he is so far above, he is so far from our minds, but he is so close to our hearts that your heart feels that you know him very intimately. And, and we mentioned in our previous sessions that we know him so intimately that when we are when we are experiencing extreme despair, moments of extreme despair, our hearts automatically reach out to him. And your heart wouldn't automatically reach out to a stranger. So our so he's distant from our minds, but that doesn't mean that he has to be distant from our hearts. Because you know, when Ahnu Akrabu Ilehim in Habdul. That he knows you better than you know yourself. So, so our inability for so just because your mind cannot comprehend him, it doesn't mean that your heart cannot embrace him. And this is why Allah says in a hadith Qudsi, La yasa'uni ardi wa la sama'i, that I am not contained by my heavens or my earth. There's only one thing that can contain me. Walakin yasa'uni. The only thing that can encompass me is the heart of the believer. And, and therefore we develop our relationship with Allah through the institution of prayer, through the institution of dua. And you know, even though our minds cannot fathom him, the eye of the heart can, uh, can witness him. And, that, and the vision of the heart is much more powerful than the vision of the eye and uh, the comprehension of the mind. And, and if I could just give, you know, one, one more analogy, you know, if you think of the, uh, an, an infant, an infant doesn't really know that this woman is its mother, but it feels the warmth, it can hear the heartbeat. It, it's instinctually, you know, uh, attracted to the mother. But it, that, that, that feeling of closeness that the infant feels is not based on the baby comprehending rationally that this is my mother. I mean, the, the baby doesn't even know the, the name of the mother, it, it, it's, it's an instinctual type of closeness. So that, that is kind of maybe an analogy that we can use to illustrate our relationship with Allah, that you know, we feel that closeness, not because we fully comprehend who he is, but there are so many ways in which we experience his love and his mercy and his compassion. 
Assalamu alaikum Sheikh. Wa alaikum assalam. Uh, Sheikh, this uh, ayah, ayah number 40, I think of 41, uh, it says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, ظهر الفساد في البر والبحر بما كسبت أيدي الناس ليضيقهم بعض الذي عملوا لعلهم يرجعون. This ayah is also mentioned in uh, Dua Ahad, which we recite in the morning. Right. Uh, so uh, does it mean that we are complaining to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about the ongoing facade uh, in this world every day what is happening around us and uh, we are supplicating to Allah and asking Allah to uh, help Imam return to bring justice and peace on this earth and that is why this ayat is mentioned in that uh, dua absolutely uh, sister is very right when she says that this uh, this verse is embedded in uh, in the in dua al-ahad and in that dua we were essentially complaining about our current state of affairs and that is that we see a world where people are disobedient to Allah that we are disobedient to God and we are witnessing the the negative consequences of our moral failings, of our injustice. And we, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to hasten the reappearance of the Imam because the Imam alayhi salam will have the authority to establish divine values on a global level and in turn will see that this, this disruption or this corruption in the created order will be, uh, will be addressed and will be mitigated under the leadership of um, of the Imam Ali and and also I'd also add that it, I mean, it just came to mind that we have narrations that say that I, I believe it's from Imam Al Sadiq where he mentions that that one of the one of the instances one of the most powerful applications of this ayah uh, is Saqifa. Because the negative consequences, we're talking about the negative consequences that the Muslim Ummah experienced and the world experienced as a result of having someone other than Ali ibn Abi Talib rule. So Imam al Sadiq, when, 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 when he was asked, you know, what is this Zahra al Fisabi fil Barri wal Bahar? He says, it is the moment. Where the Muhajireen and the Ansar were saying, you pick a leader and we'll pick a leader. And ignoring the, the leader that the Prophet appointed. I mean, just think about that one sin. The, the negative consequences that we are still experiencing, that we are still bearing today as a result of that one action. Well, how, I mean, the, I mean how, how much suffering have we endured? Because of because of unqualified leaders, and and we've been suffering ever since. So Imam Sadiq mentions, and this and this you know, going back to uh, the, what Sister uh, Sister Rabab was mentioning that Sister Asghari was mentioning that this Zahra al Fasadu fil Barri wal Bahar has continued on on a macro scale. From the day of Saqifa, and it will continue until the Zuhur of the Imam. Because so much of human deviance is a result of uh, bad leadership. So we pray for the, the reappearance of Imam Sahib al-Asr al-Zaman, who will be able to establish uh, a society, a global government that is based on truth that is based on justice that is based on divine values so he can reduce the uh, the corruption and the disorder that has appeared um, on the land and in the sea uh, there's one follow-up question uh, Sheikh uh, if Zafifa would not have happened if uh, the leadership of Imam Ali was not usurped by uh, the false leaders. Um, 
if all this would not have happened, we would have given the title of Radhi Allah and Hu to so many uh, hypocrites uh, in the sheep's clothes. We would have uh, started respecting them uh, till today uh, because that was something which was destined. Uh, this is what I think, you know, uh, uh, with my very small understanding that if that would not have happened, we would have been totally astray, right, uh, Sheikh? We would have called Radhi Allah and Ho Karam Allah Wajhum. God knows there's so many wrongdoers, you know. But I feel uh, those incidences really uh, brought about um, a yardstick to measure the truth and the uh, falsehood. And um, Allah knows best. <laughs> Allah knows best. I, I think, you know, to, to say, you know, what would have happened, you know, the only way that Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib rules after the Prophet and the only way Imam al-Hassan rules after the Prophet and the only way all of the Imams rule without any opposition would, is, is essentially to ask what would happen if, if, if Allah took away free will from people. I think that the, the desire, the lust for power is so deeply ingrained in people that Allah would essentially have to just take away their free will to allow that to, uh, to happen. But I, I think you're right in the sense that, you know, after, and this is why, you know, many companions, like, you know, Jabir ibn Abdullah al-Ansari and others, they say that we were, a, we were able to, you know, during the time of the Prophet, it was difficult to identify who is, who is a believer and who is a hypocrite. Now, after the death of the Prophet, Jabir ibn Abdullah al-Ansari, he says that we were able to differentiate between the believer and the hypocrite through their treatment of Ali ibn Abi Talib. So it, it really became a litmus test. Imam, you know, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib became a litmus test after the Prophet. That those who support him are believers. Those who oppose him are munafiqeen. And we ask Allah Azza wa Jal for his, for his guidance. And we don't want to be you know, among the munafiqeen in our, in our relation to the, the Imam of our time. The 12th Imam Ajr Allah Ta'ala. Yeah. Yes. And uh, Sheikh Azhar, what could you please explain the difference between Allahi al afwe and astaghfir Allah Rabbi wa atubu uh, the, the difference between Ilahi al afu? Uh, yes. So al afu basically means you know to pardon. You know I I ask for your pardon. Astaghfir Allah Rabbi wa atubu ilay. Istighfar. Especially it's you're asking Allah for forgiveness, but the word. Istighfar comes from, from the word ghafar, uh, which linguistically means to cover up. So while pardoning is, is general, you're asking Allah to pardon you, really not to punish you. Istighfar is asking Allah to forgive you and to also cover the, the sin. Because ghafar means to cover. Wa atubu ilayh means that not only am I asking Allah to forgive me and to cover my wrongdoing, but I am turning to him. Meaning that I'm not going to just sin and go back to my old ways. That I'm making a verbal resolution to turn. So Toba sometimes is, <clears throat> is attributed to Allah. Allah does Toba by turning to us mercifully. And when we do Toba, we turn to him, you know, to, to gain his love and his, his mercy and his attention. So that, that's, uh, those are the meanings of some of those terms. So, you know, Toba means to turn to God. Istighfar is to ask him for forgiveness and for him to cover the, the negative effects of the sin. And Al-Afu means to ask him for pardon, which is essentially to ask him to ward off uh, the punishment that might be associated with this. Thing.
Salam, Sheikh. One more question. Yes. Uh, you mentioned in the tafsir that Allah designs death. Um, what about murder? Like, for example, this Floyd who was uh, killed yes. for no, uh, this, uh, you know, on racism basis. So, uh, was that meant to be? Was that designed? Or... Now, of course, the 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 crime of murder is on the the individual, meaning that this person will be held accountable for Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala for taking the life of a person, uh, you know, who is innocent. Now. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decides, he determines whether that action is going to terminate the life of this person. So it's not that, so even though the, the individual perpetrated the crime, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ultimately decides if, if that act is going to end the, uh, the person's life. So they're not, they're not, so one can't say that oh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed that this person was going to die and therefore I'm absolved. No, the, the sin has still been committed. Allah, you know, there are many people who, you know, who might survive something like that. But that, that still, that doesn't mean that the person didn't commit a crime. Even if George Floyd didn't die, that he was, he was being treated inhumanely. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala determines, he dictates uh, if a person's time has expired, if they've reached their, uh, their edge of. And we mentioned the we, the concept of uh, of um, having uh, playing a role in your own edge. You know, so Allah apportions a range, and in His knowledge, He knows where what decisions you're going to make to 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 basically finalize uh, your uh, the length of your life. But Allah ultimately decides. Uh, you know, He ultimately decides whether that. That action is going to terminate someone's life. Right, thank you very much, Sheikh. Please keep doing your dua, and inshallah, we'll, we'll continue our discussion next week. May Allah protect you, Sheikh. May Allah protect you, Sheikh. We want more and more energetic and vibrant people like you. With your du'as, inshallah. I appreciate the du'as and the praise.